Hello there. Welcome to the Saraway channel. Wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. And don't forget to go and get that lovely warm cup of cocoa, because you deserve to spoil yourself. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Angus Buchanan found himself pulling out outside one of the exquisite palatial houses on the Battery in East Battery Street, which he considered the most beautiful street in Charleston, Carolina. The Battery is a distinguished landmark, defensive seawall and promenade that fortifies the southern tip of the city, overlooking the harbour. Angus parks his van outside one of the stately homes, possibly built in the 17th or early 18th century, overlooking the prepossessing views of the harbour. The blue water glitters brightly in the morning light. He can see the silhouettes of a couple of sailboats with their white sails blasting against the cool wind, and a luxury yacht on the horizon, while the sky is a cobalt blue, without even a hint of a fluffy cloud in sight. There are dozens of sable palm trees, penciling up into the sky, standing in front of the stately-looking mansions on the promenade, where slender vertical ribbons of grass and pristinely perfectly manicured mown hedges fringe the tiny front yards of these ornate, grandiose, luxurious dwellings that wear their history like a noteworthy badge of honour. Angus climbs out of the delivery truck, He's working for a butcher that specialises in selling grass-fed Aberdeen Angus beef for a very elite, selective, affluent clientele. The people who live along East Battery Street can easily afford such luxuries. Angus knows this road very well. He hates his job working as a delivery driver, but what can he do about it? It's either this or being forced to work for his grandfather on his South Carolina farm for a large chunk of his life which is not what he wanted to do. Angus would love to own his own farm, but working for his grandfather indefinitely, that was no life for him. Angus is sitting in his truck for a moment, taking stock. What must it be like to have this kind of wealth? The historic houses along the street go for millions of dollars. They are beautiful and proudly stand up in their lofty majesty, basking audaciously under the sun, with a haughty superior pride and a whole lot to be proud about. They're probably as stuck-up, pretentious and elitist as their owners, Angus thinks privately to himself. It's on this stunning street, when his thoughts are rudely intruded, by the loud shrieks and rude squawks of the gals flying above his truck. That is when he sees her. A young woman in her early twenties is walking along the street, pushing a rather tatty second-hand stroller in her hands. She's glancing up at the houses, as if she's looking for a particular number. What could she possibly want with any of these owners in a street like this? Unless she's looking for a job as a nanny or a housemaid. She looks distinctly out of place, Angus decides, for an area like this, and not even smart enough to be applying for a nanny's position. The woman living here on the promenade would likely be pushing on luxurious strollers, probably donned to the nines in their glitzy designer workout gear, with their personal trainer following close behind them, encouraging them to speed walk or to run while pushing their strollers to increase their heart rates and get their post-pregnancy bodies back into shape so they look glamorous for their next gala event or charity dinner. The young woman is wearing a sundress that looks like it's been through the washing cycle over a thousand times. No woman on the street would dare to be seen wearing a dress like this. It looks well-worn, tattered even, as if it's been bought from a thrift shop. There's something about the young woman's reluctant walk, her obvious hesitancy, that grabs Angus's attention. She keeps looking up and down the silent street, as if making absolutely sure that no one is around and no one is watching her. When she looks in Angus's direction, he hurriedly buries his head behind the van's front panel, so she doesn't see him. Why he impulsively does this, he's not sure. The young woman looks furtive, but also troubled at the same time. An uncomfortable tangle of emotions. She's clearly up to something, Angus can sense in his gut. But what? 
The woman stands out the side the big mansion, staring up at it. It's the house where Angus is about to make his delivery. She leans into the stroller and appears to be talking lovingly to her baby. There are tears spilling down her cheeks. In a trice the woman composes herself, wipes away her tears, straightens up her back and skulkingly moves to the gleaming black front door with its smart bronze knocker. She rings the bell, positioning the stroller in front of the door so it can't possibly be missed. Then she abandons it, bolting down the street in a tearing hurry, running away as fast as she can, barely stopping to draw breath. Angus can see her throwing herself into a battered old red Toyota Yaris that looks like it's as bedraggled as its owner. The woman drives away at breakneck speed in a tearing hurry. What the heck, he thinks. Why did she abandon the stroller like this? He climbs out of his white Ford Transit truck with the logo Hickory Dickory Meat. He walks over to the stroller and he can see a tiny baby lying fast asleep, dressed in a blue onesie and covered in a white cotton blanket. There's a bag in the stroller filled with formula, nappies and a note. To Mr. and Mrs. Harris, I know you're people of means. I've also done my research and understand you've already adopted a child of your own, so I'm sure you must be very good people who would have the heart to take in my baby and adopt him as your own. All my life I have struggled financially and I doubt things will change in that regard. I cannot look after my little boy, but I want him to have the opportunities in life that were never given to me which is why I have chosen and selected a wealthy family of privilege like yourself, whom I know have already adopted a child. I am crossing my fingers that you will choose to adopt my boy as your own, but if you can't, I do hope you will select a loving home for him. I know my son's father comes from Irish descent, and my family is originally from Maine. I do not know of any genetic diseases or disorders in my family line. I want you to know giving my little boy up is the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my entire life. I want him to know that after he was born, holding him in my arms was the very best moment of my life. Please let him know he was always loved, and it is because of this great love that I am leaving him with you. I want him to have the very best life has to offer, and this is the hardest decision I've ever had to make. Angus stares at the note incredulously and stuffs it in the back pocket of his jeans. Then a bizarre thought comes into his mind. He can use this baby as leverage to get exactly what he wants. The door of the grandiose old house opens promptly. Mrs. Harris, the owner, is standing in the doorway expectantly. She'd been ardently waiting for Angus's delivery. She's a kind woman in her forties, who's always well presented, like most of the wealthy elite in these parts, without a single hair out of place, thanks to her illustrious hairstylist. A man called Franco Fiorentino, who's all the rage among the well-heeled in these parts. But she always treats Angus with respect. Hello, Angus. It's great to see you, young man. Have you got my Aberdeen Angus there? Yes, I have, says Angus. Good. My husband is looking forward to a steak dinner tonight with only the finest grass-fed beef. Goodness gracious me! What is that tatty-looking stroller doing out here? Oh, it's mine. I must apologise, Mrs. Harris. It's my baby in there, you see. I thought I'd take him for a walk down the promenade to enjoy the fabulous views over the harbour. You're the last delivery on my list today. You do live in the most stunning street in South Carolina, he says, pointing at the views. Do you know, Angus, you're absolutely right about that. I'm a very spoilt woman, you know. Sometimes I don't realise how good I have it. I do apologise about how rude I've been about your stroller. Mrs. Harris looks wistfully at the scenery. It is magnificent out there, and such a lovely day. So often I fail to appreciate just how lucky I am. I glance out at these views every day, and I'm quick to take things for granted. But my little seven-year-old Stephen, I adopted him very soon after he was born, you know. Well, he brings me down to earth with a great big mighty bang. There's nothing like a kid to do that for you. 
You don't mind, Angus, if I have a little look at your baby. I do love babies so much. Of course not, said Angus. Be my guest. Oh, isn't he absolutely adorable? What a delight! What perfect blue eyes! And he's got such a charming little nature. I think he is laughing at me. Let me tell you, when I adopted my Stephen, he was as small as this one is, says Mrs. Harris, ooing and eyeing at the little baby. Angus can see why the discerning young woman had dropped her baby off outside Mrs. Harris's house. She clearly knew that the woman would adopt her son. She must have been watching the residents in the street very carefully, and how they interacted with their children, he concluded. Or somehow she found out about Mrs. Harris. Oh, he is quite delightful, said Mrs. Harris. One of the most beautiful babies I've ever seen. Oh, look at that teddy bear. Did your wife make it? I've never seen one quite like it. It's magnificently stitched. It's like a patchwork teddy bear. Something you'd buy from a designer boutique. Where did you get it? No, my wife didn't make it. I think she got it from a friend who makes them. Now what about your delivery, Mrs. Harris? Oh, of course. We can't forget my husband's steaks. I'd never hear the end of it. I'd happily be a vegetarian, you know. But my husband, he cannot live without his meat. And only the best will ever do. It has to be grass-fed. Angus chuckles. Well, there is no accounting for good taste, is there, Mrs. Harris? He says, dashing to his van to retrieve the parcel of meat for Mrs. Harris to sign. Off with you, dear, then. The weather is quite spectacular. The view is magnificent. You go and enjoy that walk of yours with your gorgeous little son. She leans into the pram. Goodbye, little one. It's been quite a pleasure to meet you. Be good for your little daddy, will you? Goodbye, Mrs. Harris. Goodbye, Angus. Angus quickly bundles the baby into the back of his delivery truck and folds up the stroller, which he tosses into the back of the truck. Thank God Mrs. Harris was his last delivery for the day. He immediately drives out of Charleston towards his father's farm, and for the first time in his life he can smell victory in the air, almost tasted on his tongue. It was like fate had serendipitously smiled down upon him, auspiciously from the sky, whispering into his heart, Angus, this is your lucky day. Your life is about to change exponentially from now on. What a stroke of luck, he thought, to stumble across that stroller, quite by chance. It was over an hour and a half's drive to his grandfather's farm, where Angus had grown up as a boy. He loved his grandparents. They were good people, but he didn't like the way they wanted to dictate the course of his life. They were desirous for him to live on their farm indefinitely, but Angus wanted a farm all of his own, and he had the very place in mind that had been on the market for over a week now. Angus needed his own independence, without having his grandparents breathing down his back every minute of the day, telling him how to live his life, to do this and to do that. His grandparents were well-meaning, but their control over his life had been suffocatingly oppressive, which was why he was renting a crappy apartment in Charleston and working for a specialised family-run butchery, 24-7. Both of his grandparents were affluent. The wealth came from his grandmother's side of the family. Money was not a subject his grandparents ever discussed in front of him growing up. His grandmother would say talking about money was exceedingly vulgar and in very poor taste. Angus had never known his mother. She had fallen pregnant with him at fifteen years old, and clandestinely hidden her pregnancy from her parents. Once Angus was born in the upstairs bathroom, she had abandoned her baby and run away from home, with a note telling her mother and father, Sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen. Don't try and find me. Despite his grandparents' very best efforts, his mother had never been found, but they had never stopped trying to locate their daughter's whereabouts by hiring numerous private investigators, but to no avail. Everything led to a dead end. It was their daughter running away from them as a little girl that had probably made his grandparents very controlling and possessive over Angus's life, as if they were afraid of letting him go, as that would be like losing their beloved daughter all over again, as he was the only part of their daughter they had left. 
Soon the delivery truck he used for his job was humming down the long driveway that was fringed on one side with, with viridescent green fields of soya bean crops, and on the other side was a plethora of trees. In a trice he was parked outside his grandparents' farmhouse. He climbed out of the car, taking the little bundle out of the passenger side door into his arms. He was surprised how well behaved this little baby was. It gurgled and chuckled happily, looking up at him with its round blue eyes. Even Angus found himself quite charmed by the little bundle. For the first time in his young life, Angus felt exceedingly empowered, rarely empowered. He knew his grandparents would bite the bait, and he would be able to dictate the size of the catch. He was certain about that. The door of the farmhouse was swiftly flung open by Angus's grandfather, who was called Beaver. Angus had never known him by any other name. His grandmother had told him Beaver had earned his name from his industrious determination to get things done. It was true his grandfather was exceedingly efficient. Angus watches his grandfather standing in the doorway, his bright eyes twinkling. The man was wearing a red plaid jacket and a pair of blue jeans. Angus can see his father look surprised but rather pleased to see him. His blue eyes sweep over the bundle in his arms. Perturbed, they grow significantly rounder and rounder, and his mute unspoken words ring into Angus's ears. What have you got there? Is that bundle what I think it is? It's not a baby, is it? But he doesn't say a thing. Things had gone better than Angus could have ever imagined. His grandparents, or shall I say his grandmother, had bitten the bait better than he could have ever envisaged. So what happened exactly? asked his grandmother, who had taken the baby from Angus's arms and was rocking it in her arms tenderly, talking all kinds of nonsense to it. Aren't you a sweet little one? Oh, look at you! The little baby's hands were clasping hers. It wrapped its tiny little fingers into hers, looking into his grandmother's eyes adoringly. Angus could see his grandmother was smitten. This was a very promising start. Oh, look at him! Oh, my God, he's so adorable! What is all this about, Angus? Who does this baby belong to? She pauses for a moment, as if she's been hit over the head with a large brick. It's not your baby, is it, Angus? It is my baby, and I hasten to say, your great-grandchild said Angus proudly, surprised at how fluidly the lie rolled off his tongue. I had a relationship with a girl called Angie nine months ago. A very flaky type. You know what I mean. Head all over the place. All kinds of issues. Not very stable. Well, unfortunately, I made her pregnant. She dumped the baby on me this morning. Said she was in a right mood, let me just tell you that. She got very, very stroppy. Said she didn't want our baby. It was my responsibility. I was to take care of it or put it up for adoption. She didn't care. She dumped the baby on me this morning. She was in a right old mood. She can get very stroppy. She said she didn't want our baby. It was my responsibility and that I was to take care of it or put it up for adoption. She didn't care. She dumped her baby on you said his grandmother, looking appalled. Everyone knows a baby belongs with its mother. Why would she do such a dreadful thing? She sounds incredibly selfish, if you ask me. I'll say this for you, Angus. You do know how to pick them. The last girlfriend you brought around to the house was really quite dreadful. No manners at all, and an unbridled tongue on her that caused great offence, I might add. I didn't appreciate her saying I looked like Nancy Reagan. Do you have any idea how old that woman is? I'm sure she didn't mean anything by it, Mum. In her day, Nancy Reagan was a very elegant woman, you know. Grace growled. That's not what she meant, and you know it, Angus. She was inadvertently telling me I was old, and I did not appreciate that. All right, I admit it. You're right, Gran. I don't have the best track record with women. Let's just say Angie wouldn't know responsibility a day in her life. She wants nothing to do with the baby. So I came here so that you could have first refusal. Angus's grandmother looks confounded. She runs her weathered hand through her mane of silvery curls, 
and gives him a puzzled look. Stop speaking in riddles, Angus. I hate it when you do that. What do you mean by first refusal? Angus's back straightened. I'm going to get my baby put up for adoption. If you want to raise your great-grandson, then you are going to pay me for the privilege. Otherwise, I shall dump him at the first adoption agency. You might think that that is cruel, but it's the way it is. You can see I am not equipped to look after a baby. Of course, I would like to, but I don't have the time on my hands. I'm far too busy for that. What are you trying to do? Blackmail me, Angus? asked his grandmother, because I don't like the sound of that. I raised you better than that. Blackmail? What are you saying? Absolutely not. What do you take me for, Granny? I'm just being extremely practical. I can't look after my baby, but you both can. You know I don't want to work on this farm. I want to own my own place. I need my independence, my freedom. You've got money. I haven't. If you pay me a handsome lump sum, you can raise your great grandbaby. I can buy myself my own farm. It's a simple business transaction. That's all. You can like it or lump it. You can't say I'm not playing fair. I could have handed your great grandbaby over to the adoption agency, and you would be none the wiser about his existence. But as you can see, I'm giving you a choice, and that is a privilege. I'm being incredibly reasonable towards you. Do you want to raise your great-grandbaby or not? Would you like a perfect stranger to raise him? Would you like to abandon your own flesh and blood? I know how devastated you were when my mother ran away from home when she was fifteen years old. You wouldn't want to lose this one, would you? Of course I don't want to abandon my great-grandbaby. He's absolutely adorable, but Angus, I'm not getting any younger. I'm just about seventy years old. How could I look after a baby? I'm getting long in the tooth, you could say. No, you're not piped, Angus. Age is only a state of mind. You know it is. You don't even look a day over fifty. You've always been robustly healthy. Of course you can look after your great-grandchild. Unless, of course, you want me to hand him over to the adoption agency. Which I think would be a dreadful pity. Think about it. You'd never see your great-grandson again. Besides, if you need help, you've got lots of money to hire a nanny to work for you. She could move into the farmhouse, help you take care of your grandchild. You've got it all worked out, Angus, haven't you? said his grandmother incredulously. But you're right, we can hire a full-time nanny. I'll be damned if my great-grandson is raised by strangers. She lifts the baby up in her arms, her face lighting up. Oh, he is so beautiful, so totally and utterly beautiful. The baby gurgles, staring at her with its bright blue eyes so curiously, and he can see his grandfather has bitten the bait. She looks quite flustered, her skin has grown pink, as if she suddenly feels quite excited about the prospect of looking after her great-grandson. Angus cannot believe how easy things are going. He has his grandmother hooked. She'll never want to give up her great-grandson. Angus has all the trump cards in his hands. If this was a game of poker, he'd have a royal flush. What is his name? She asks Angus with big eyes. Angus thinks quickly on his feet. His name is Harris, which is the only name that comes tumbling into his head after having delivered meat to Mrs. Harris only moments before. But ironically, it's not a bad name for a boy, he thinks. Harris, says his grandmother. Now that's quite a lovely name. I think our little Harris here needs his nappy changed, and I'm sure he's hungry. I'm glad to see that your girlfriend at least got some diapers and a change of clothes for him. I mean, what on earth is wrong with that woman, wanting to abandon her baby like this? She sounds like quite the most ghastly woman. I'm so glad you never introduced me to her. So, Granny, do we have a deal or not? asked Angus. Well, it's not like I have much of a choice in the matter, do I? I can't see I've got lots of options. 
says his grandmother, looking up at Angus soberly. You know I can't abandon my great-grandchild, put him in the arms of strangers. How could I possibly live with myself? So yes, Angus, we have a deal. Beaver, get me my checkbook, will you? Angus can see his grandfather shaking his head. Are you sure this is a good idea, Grace? Aren't we a bit long in the tooth to raise our great-grandchild? And do you realise our Angus is bribing you? Beaver, are you listening to me or not? I don't want to have to ask you again. Get me my checkbook, came his grandmother's stern voice. Our great-grandchild's fate is not for your discussion. I will not have a perfect stranger raising our great-grandchild under any circumstances. That is non-negotiable. Our great-grandson needs us. He is our flesh and blood, and I, for one, will never abandon him. Besides, Angus is absolutely right. We can hire a nanny to move in with us to help us care for the child. It's a win-win situation. And we could do with a spirited child in our lives again. It's been lonesome for us since Angus left home. Maybe it's not going to be so hard if Angus does buy his own place. I'm sure he will be around here frequently to visit his son. I'm quite sure we can make this work and give Harris the great life he deserves. Angus's heart thunders with excitement as his grandmother pulls out her checkbook from her leather handbag that Beaver handed over to her with an air of reluctance. But this is family money, from her side of the family, and she can dictate how the money is spent. So Beaver doesn't have much of a say in the matter. Thank God, thinks Angus. Beaver would be a tough nut to crack. Not so easy to bring out his checkbook, but his grandmother can be more easily duped. How much? she asks Angus, lifting her pen over the checkbook. How much, Angus? Angus would ask for one and a half million dollars. That would be a great start. If the rumours were remotely true, his grandmother could easily afford it. If she wasn't that rich, she'd reason with him and bring the price right down. But it was always good to aim big. One and a half million dollars, Granny. It's a small price to pay for little Harris here. And you know you can afford it. Angus can see his grandfather's jaw drop open. His eyes grow round. You're asking for a hell of a lot, son. Aren't you being a wee bit unreasonable on your grandmother? Well, do you want your great-grandbaby or not? I told you, this is a business transaction. It's not personal. It is what it is. Like it or lump it. Angus sees his grandmother scribbling on her cheque, which she hands to him with her trembling hand. Angus studies the cheque, his eyes growing round. It's made out to him personally, and it's for one and a half million dollars. He's hit the jackpot. I'll confirm the cheque with the bank, his grandmother tells him reassuringly. I'll get them to transfer it into your account as soon as possible. Angus wanted to whoop with joy, but he maintained his composure. Thanks, Gran. You won't regret it. And don't see me out. Angus wasted no time in driving to the farmhouse that was up for sale, half an hour away from his parents' farmhouse that was having an open day today for potential buyers to look at the premises. As Angus's delivery truck rolls down the drive of this prepossessing part of land in South Carolina, he cannot believe the serendipitous events of the morning. And to think he so nearly called in sick this morning with a headache, he could have lost all this. The farm had previously been a cattle ranch, but the couple selling it were retiring. But the moment he'd seen the property, Angus knew he wanted it at once. He drove down the long sweeping corridors of the red dirt roads covered with archways of tall trees which were tangled sculptural boughs from either side of the road that weaved into each other. Finally he takes a swift right-hand turn and finds himself driving through the wrought iron gates and picket fence down the long driveway that leads to a stunning federal-style red-bricked farmhouse. The house was nestled against a billowing backdrop of trees and on the right-hand side of the house was an ocean of meadows that stretched out for many miles. From the moment Angus had seen the farmhouse, he'd fallen for the place, hook, line and sinker, but without the money to buy the place, he could see his dream slipping through his fingers like butter. But not today. Things were different today. The air smelled fresher, the world seemed brighter and so much more agreeable. When he climbed out of his truck, he could see the smug, self-entitled estate agent standing in the doorway of the farmhouse with a frown on his face, 
The man was clearly not pleased to see Angus yet again, and Angus knew why. The man didn't like time wasters bothering him. They were like annoying flies he wanted to swat. He thinks he's all that, Angus told himself, dressed to the nines in his expensive pinstripe suit and pointed shiny crocodile shoes, and looks completely out of place on a farm like this. You again, he snipes when he sees Angus. As you can see, I'm presenting an open day for people who can actually afford to buy this farm. Not for time wasters like yourself, who want to own this place but simply haven't got the means. I'll pretend I didn't hear that, shall I? As it happens, I am here to make you an offer for the place. I will give you the full asking price, and you can't say fairer than that. Yeah, like I believe that in a month of Sundays. You don't have the money. I do. Angus pulls out his mother's cheque. I'll be depositing this into my bank account when I return to town. You can phone up the bank to see if they're expecting a transfer of these funds. And this cheque is legitimate. After which you can phone up the sellers and say it's a cash offer, and I will give them their full asking price. Is that a deal or not? The estate agent gawked at Angus, looking bemused. He made a couple of phone calls to confirm with the bank that the million and a half dollar cheque was indeed to be deposited and was legit. He was satisfied, so his demeanour changed. His tight downward scowl turned up into the brightest grin. He suddenly treated Angus as if Angus was his best buddy and not a lower form of pond life. You've done well for yourself, he said in a saccharine voice. I'm quite sure you will be thrilled with the property, and I'm quite certain the sellers will accept your offer at once. I must apologise, he said, looking bashful, for not thinking you were a legitimate buyer. Well, next time you should not be so quick to judge the book by the cover, should you? We don't all go poncing around the place in pinstripe suits and debonair boots. It was amazing how money could change people's attitudes towards you, and in the estate agent's case he was clearly getting a high from the smell of his commission cheque. He certainly looked as if he would be popping the champagne once Angus left. What a jerk, he said. A real jerk. Fifteen years later. Harris enjoyed spending time at his father's farm. He and his father Angus had grown very close in recent years. Growing up as a young boy, it had struck him as strangely enigmatic that he didn't bear the family characteristics physically. He had dark hair and a long Irish face and blue eyes, whereas everyone else in his family had more of a square jawline and very aristocratic noses with a pointed tip, but he didn't resemble them at all. His grandmother had told him that this was likely due to the fact that he might bear a striking resemblance to his mother's side of the family. It was only when he saw his father the previous weekend and asked him a plethora of uncomfortable questions about his birth mother that his father Angus became exceedingly uncomfortable. Harris could not shake the irksome feeling that there was something about his childhood his father and great-grandparents weren't actually telling him. He had learnt from his great-grandmother Grace that his mother Angie had given birth to him and dumped him on his father and just disappeared into the sunset, never to be seen or heard from again. It's not something you should take personally, Harris, she had told him. According to your father, your mother Angie didn't like to be responsible. She wanted a carefree life, not to be saddled with kids. But the moment I saw you, Harris, I was smitten. For the record, your father was dreadful in his selection of women. Always chose the most unstable woman to date, until he married Peggy. And well, let's just say, that woman is a rock. She's changed your father. Made him so much of a better man. I'm quite sure your mother loved you, but she possibly just didn't want the hassle of raising a kid. It's not for everyone, you know. Harris loved his stepmother, Peggy. She was the best thing that had ever happened to his father. Peggy was the kind of woman that wore her heart on her sleeve and absolutely hated secrets of any kind. One weekend, when Harris was staying at the farmhouse, he told Peggy his misgivings. He knew he could talk to her about anything. She was a great listener, and she usually had some kind of solution to offer him. Peggy, he said over breakfast that morning, when Angus was out of earshot, 
What is it, Harris? she asked. You look, well, what's the word? Confounded, as if there's a weight on your mind. Last weekend, when I was asking Dad about my birth mother, he became very twitchy. I knew he was hiding something from me. Is there something I should know? Peggy sat down on the chair opposite him and took Harris's hand in hers. I told your father that if he wasn't going to tell you the truth, that I would. You know what I'm like. I hate secrets of any kind. Now you know your father loves you very much, and so do both of your great-grandparents. But Harris told me that you're not his real son, not by blood. But you are in his heart, of course. What? said Harris. You mean I'm adopted? Why didn't they tell me this? Peggy pauses for a moment. No, you're not adopted, nor are you related to your father by blood, or your great-grandparents. It's quite a story, actually. How you came to be the biggest blessing in our lives, myself included. Although what your father did was impulsively foolish, but sometimes mistakes can have silver linings at the end of them, as was in this case. Your father was working for a butchery specialising in grass-fed meat, and he delivered his meat to affluent clients. One day he saw a young woman with a tattered stroller, walking up an illustrious street, looking for a Pacific mansion. It was a huge mansion, where the wealthy occupants had already adopted a young child. The woman clearly thought they'd adopt you too, if they found you outside their front door. So she left them a note, telling them how much she loved you, and wanted you to have the best life ever, and she hoped they'd adopt you, and give you the opportunities in life that she could never have. So my mother wasn't this Angie woman, who didn't want me at all. Peggy squeezes Harris's hand again. Well, your mother obviously did want you, but she clearly couldn't afford to keep you. Or even if she could, she was thinking about what she wanted for you. A good education, I imagine. Fabulous holidays abroad. Great opportunities in life. Stuff that she never had. But what has that got to do with my dad? I don't understand. Your father was in love with this farm. It was on the market at the time. He couldn't afford to buy it. He knew your great-great-grandmother had money. So he grabbed you in your stroller rather impulsively, placed you into his truck, hiding your mother's note in his jean pockets. He thought he could use you as leverage. As leverage? asked Harris, gasping. I was used as leverage. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I know it sounds absolutely ghastly, cold and heartless, but I'm not going to candy coat it for you. I must confess what Angus did was inexcusable. He managed to persuade your great-grandmother to pay him big bucks for the privilege of keeping you. They thought you were their real great-grandchild. I don't know how to take this, Peggy. This is way too much to digest. Well, there is one thing I can tell you, Harris, that your father, Angus, who sees himself as your father, told me that you are the best thing that has ever happened in his entire life. He told me he did not know it was possible to love this much. And both your great-grandparents believe that you are the greatest blessing that has ever happened in their lives. They're always saying that. They love the bones of you. Don't you ever forget that. But what if they find out that I'm not their legitimate great-grandchild? Will they still love me? I don't think you should tell them that you're not. I don't believe it would change a thing, because they love you to death. But some secrets are best not shared. I think you deserve to know the truth. Angus won't be very pleased I told you all this, but I believe you deserve to know the truth. Thank you, Peggy. I'm not sure whether finding all this out has made me feel any better, but I did have an inkling that something wasn't right. I'm not sure how I feel about not being related to my father by blood. It's, it doesn't make any difference, sweetheart. Blood doesn't make any difference at all. As far as Angus is concerned, you will always be his son. Do you understand that? I think so. It was later that morning that Harris took himself for a long walk in the Woodgrove. He barely noticed what a magnificent morning it was. His mind was naturally all over the place, as he tried to get his head around the fact that the family that had raised him over all these years was not really his real blood family. The soft sunlight filtered through the trees as Harris kicked the ground with his walking boots. And then he saw it. Lying there on the soft earthen ground of the woodgrove was this massive rock-like structure. But where had it come from?
He'd never seen anything like it before. In that moment, all thoughts of his family bloodline were expunged from his mind, as an intrigue washed over him, consuming his curiosity. He unhesitantly walked towards the peculiar-looking structure, and on close inspection, it looked like a huge bear had been turned into a rock, becoming petrified or even fossilized. He began to kick at it as hard as he possibly could, and even beat it with a large stick. But the structure was solid, unyielding, very stiff. It was as if the bear had become a stone, but it looked to be a very, very large bear. It couldn't be anything else, but he couldn't see the face, arms or legs, as the creature seemed to be like one massive ball of hair. But it was as hard as a stone. Harris was genuinely stumped. How could an animal turn into stone? Weren't fossils created over thousands of years? He couldn't wait to get back to the farmhouse to tell his father about the strange anomaly. And then he remembered that Angus wasn't his father. But it didn't change anything for him. Not really. He loved Angus like a father and Peggy like a mother. And he adored his great-grandparents, Grace and Beaver. And he'd had the best, the greatest childhood you could ever dream of. He had nothing to complain about. When he returned to the farmhouse after his walk, his father Angus was standing in the doorway, his eyes bleary and red. I'm sorry, son. I didn't mean you to find out like this. Peggy wasn't right to tell you all this. Harris ran into his father's arms. They held each other tightly. I want to tell you something, Harris. You will always be my son forever, no matter what. I love you more than life itself. Do you know that? I know that, Dad. I feel the same way about you. You'll always be my father. No one can take that away from you. Harris lay in bed all night at the farmhouse, unable to get a wink of sleep. His mind was racing at a hundred miles an hour. He started to think about his real mother, dropping him off in a tatty stroller outside a fancy house on East Battery Street, overlooking the harbour. She had clearly wanted to sacrifice everything by giving her son the very best that life has to offer. You succeeded, Mum. Wherever you are, you succeeded. I had the best childhood anyone could ever ask for. All of a sudden, the strange anomaly that he'd seen earlier on in the day came shooting back into his head. He had wanted to show his father the strange fossil, but he had forgotten clean about it. He then heard Peggy talking to his father. Why don't you come to bed, Angus? You can't stay up all night. There's a lot on my mind, Peggy, he could hear his father saying. Harris quickly climbed out of bed and trotted over to the living room, where he knew he'd find his father. Angus looked up in surprise to see Harris standing there. Why haven't you gone to bed, son? Can't you get to sleep after everything you've been told today? I can't sleep, said Harris. Like you say, everything you told me, it's a lot to take in. I'm sure it is, son. I am sorry about that. I can't sleep either. But I can't say I regret taking you all those years ago from East Battery Street in that stroller. You're the best thing that has ever happened to me. Dad, you won't believe what I found in the woodgrove this morning. I found a fossilised bear. It had turned into stone. Is this some kind of joke? asked Angus incredulously. I mean, animals don't turn into fossils. They don't get petrified like wood, you know. I promise you it's true. I tried to beat the stone up, but it was as solid as a rock. But I could tell it had been an animal at one time. It's huge. You can see all the hair very clearly. Now this I need to see, says Angus. Do you fancy an evening stroll, son? It might do us the world of good. Perhaps it'll tire us so we can finally get some sleep tonight. Why not, says Harris. I want you to see that I'm not making this up. Angus and his son clandestinely slip out of the farmhouse, wearing headlights, heavy walking boots and carrying rifles just for protection. It's a pleasantly warm summer night, but a cool breeze sweeps across the countryside so that the trees begin to dance under its fresh nudges. The wind makes the sound of what Harris always describes as respiration or rapid breathing. The illustrious moon hangs inspirationally on the roof of the sky, like a large, round, golden pendant.
accompanied by hundreds of glittering diamonds. It's definitely a full moon tonight. Everything is being cast in that ethereal silvery glaze that lends a magical luster to the ambience and provides a magnanimous illumination. They can hear the trills of crickets and frogs, the distant hoot of an owl. Angus and Harris trample the earthen trail under their hardened boots. They can hear the twigs beneath their soles snap, crackle and pop. What's that strange noise? whispers Harris. It sounds like people singing. They clandestinely tiptoe behind the trees towards the strange noise. Angus indicates for his son to follow his lead. They position themselves behind a tree, and what they see baffles them. They switch off their headlights at once. As the light of the moon is so good, they can see the ambiguous creatures very clearly. They see four Bigfoot standing over what Harris believed was the fossilised stone of a black bear that he had discovered earlier in the morning. Harris realises at once that these creatures are definitely Bigfoot, there is no doubt. But he is struck by how human their noble-looking faces are, with the chiselled cheekbones, the sloping foreheads. The creatures are enormous. Harris and his father are sure the smallest must be only seven foot tall, the largest easily over nine foot. They're burly, robust, powerfully lofty-looking creatures, covered in long flowing dark hair. Harris and Angus don't even feel an iota of fear, for they are in reverent awe of what is happening before their eyes. Fear does not even entertain their minds, as their intrigue has robbed them of any hesitant reluctancy. They stand there as still as the trees, watching this idiosyncratic ceremony unfold. The largest Bigfoot is wearing a long necklace of eagle's feathers. He appears to be talking in a strange language. It sounds almost like he's chanting. Ika ziva pokolo, ha sina anilona, hi gosh la la fakanasi, ha mola bisi, ila nikola fikenasa. All the other Bigfoot put their hands on the big stone that Harris had assumed was a fossil of a bear. The large Bigfoot breathes over the stone, and then suddenly, by magic, it begins to move. Harris hears the sound of crystal shattering, as if the creature on the ground is breaking out of a glass cabinet, and then he stands erect on his two feet. It's another Bigfoot. He stretches out his arms above his head, and looks up at the other Bigfoots in surprise with that lost, where-am-I kind of perturbed look on his face. Harris gets the impression he has no memory of his stone-like incarceration. The Bigfoots react by whooping in delight, dancing around the forest in glee, as if their friend that had been caught up in a trap is now free. The Bigfoot that had been rescued looks enigmatically puzzled. He scratches his head, and then the other Bigfoots excitedly start talking to him over each other so that the Bigfoot can't hear a word of what they're saying. It's like all the Bigfoots want to tell him the story about how he ended up where he is, what had actually happened to him. Something very bizarre must have occurred to him for him to turn into stone like that, but thank God he had no memory of the experience, Harris thought. The large male Bigfoot, wearing the feathers, raises his hand. He whistles. The excited commotion stops at once. He then speaks to the rescued Bigfoot in his language. Opakila, he shokola na shaka, ha vashalawo, he silogolin, amanila shonakalasiki. Harris is sure he's telling him what happened. The rescued Bigfoot seems nonplussed. He's nodded as he listens intently, and then he joins in the celebratory mood. And the Bigfoots continue to dance around the woodgrove, beating their large feet on the ground, oscillating their arms above their heads in the air, and letting out whistles and happy whoops. The sound is so intimidating that the trills of the crickets and frogs go mute. Harris and his father watch the Bigfoots for a couple of hours, and then they slip away into the night, returning to the farmhouse. Son, says Angus, putting his arms around Harris. Encountering the Bigfoots marks the occasion when you found out the real truth about your birth. And I think Peggy's right. It's good that you know the truth. But it doesn't change anything. You're the light of our lives, and you're my son. You saw how excited that those Bigfoot are? Well, I feel just like that, knowing you are around. Six months later... Harris is in the kitchen with Peggy, 
helping her prepare blueberry muffins for breakfast. Peggy has taught Harris all she knows about cooking, as the young man has an incredible interest in all things food-related, and Peggy has a sneaking suspicion that Harris might one day become a chef. Suddenly they hear a woman's truck rolling down the driveway and parking directly outside the farmhouse. The woman looks hesitant, as if she's beginning to have a panic attack of some kind, and has lost her nerve. But Peggy, on seeing her, tells Harris to continue preparing the blueberry muffins. She dashes out towards the woman. Harris watches as they engage in a deep conversation together, and then he sees Peggy leading the woman into the kitchen, with a broad beam on her face. Harris finds himself staring at a woman, who looks a lot like himself. Surely not, he thinks. Harris, says Peggy, smiling, this is your birth mother, Claudia Knight. The woman rushes towards Harris, and they both embrace. Oh, it's wonderful to finally meet you. I'm so sorry I left you in a stroller outside a house all those years ago. I was desperate. I wanted you to have an amazing life, and I knew I couldn't give it to you. That's all forgiven and forgotten, said Harris. You did what you thought was best, and for the record I've had a great life. But how did you find me? I don't understand. I went to that mansion where I left you as a baby. I was expecting you to be there. I was sure the woman had adopted you. She said there was never a time when she found an abandoned baby in a stroller on her front doorstep. She couldn't remember a time fifteen years ago. But then she did remember a delivery driver called Angus, working at a butchery, delivering her meat one morning, who claimed a baby that she saw in a very tatty stroller belonged to him. She believed him that it was his boy, of course, but she did say he was unusually twitchy. I asked her to describe the stroller to me, the baby, what was inside it. Then she talked about the patchwork teddy bear I made you. I knew the man had taken you for some reason. I contacted the butchery, and one of the men working there is still friends with your father, so he gave me your address. He told me that your father had a fifteen-year-old son, and I knew you were mine. He even found a picture of you on social media and the resemblance you had to me was uncanny. I only contacted you because I'd like to get to know my son, if that's all right with you. All right, said Harris. You bet it's all right. I'd love to get to know you better. To cut a long story short, Harris never told his grandparents he wasn't related to them by blood, but he continued a relationship with his birth mother, and he believes fate smiled down on him favourably when Angus took him away that fateful day for leverage. As for his experience with the Bigfoots, the strange event of that preposterous night still makes him say, what the hell was that all about? He has reached the conclusion that some memories are not meant to be solved. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.